Today's scripture reading comes from John 10, 1 through 2 and 6 through 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Samantha. Would you read together with me a prayer of illumination? Lord, you are the good shepherd and have laid down your life for us. Help us to hear your voice today, to listen and to obey. Lead us to green pasture where we may feast on your word. Protect us from what is false and from those who would seek to lead us astray. Through your Holy Spirit, give us the strength to follow you. Amen. Well, amen. Well, good morning. And again, let me say happy Father's Day. I hope... You have a restful day, an enjoyable day with your children and with your grandchildren. I hope that today is, is both fun, but also a day for us to reflect on the honor uh, that it is uh, to be a father and a grandfather. We are so grateful uh, for the way that you guys invest, not only your children and grandchildren, but your spiritual children and grandchildren as well. Well, just yesterday, I, I received a text from a friend, and in this text, it was a uh, an article, a picture of an article or a video or something that uh, was, was fairly political. And then underneath it, it had a, a statement about what he had, had sent. And for the darnest time, I could not figure out if he was being sarcastic or not. And so I'm sitting with this thing and I'm going, oh, I hope he sees what I see, like all of us do when we get those text messages. And, and being a, uh, a pastor that I am, I gave him a six paragraph thesis on what I thought about was the video. And as you can imagine, I get a text back and it says, no, nah, man, I was just being kidding. I thought that was ridiculous too. Man, we live in such a confusing time, don't we? And so often there are voices coming from different directions. Even as we interact with our friends, they'll send articles or comments or things and we, we don't know, okay, do I, do I interact there? Do I not? Is, is, are they being funny? Uh, I just want you to know, I did clarify for this friend, uh, there's a thing called emojis and ha's and LOLs that are very helpful uh, in discerning things like that. But the times are confusing. And in today's passage, Jesus is gonna describe himself in two more different ways. We're in a series and that series is, is called So That You Would Believe. And we've been walking through John and we've been seeing the signs that he's given and we've been seeing the declarations that he's made about himself. And in John 10, he gives us two more. He says that I am the door and I am the good shepherd. And one of those key things that he says about being the good shepherd is he says that the sheep hear my voice. So we're gonna walk through this passage uh, this morning. And before we do, would you join me as we pray together? Jesus, thank you. Lord, we come to you as the good shepherd. Even as we've just prayed together corporately, we do ask that you would take your word and you would allow us to hear it with ears that can hear. That you would take your word and you would take those seeds and you would plant them deep in our hearts. Lord, we desperately want to be sheep that hear your voice. And so, Lord, would you, would you help us to that end? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. The, the imagery that, that Jesus is obviously giving here, right, is one of a shepherd, uh, one of a, a, a farmer, so to speak, 
with sheep. And one of the things that's important to recognize is that the pictures in this, um, in this analogy are, are a little bit unique to what we'd probably imagine for a shepherd because back then, oftentimes, there, was, there were community flocks. And so there would, there would be a pen, and what you would do is, in order to save money, but also for protection against wolves and thieves, you would build oftentimes that pen into a, a stone enclosure, right? It might be the mountain itself that you've kind of built it into, uh, but you're going to build walls kind of around the back three sides, and then you're going to have a fence. You're going to have a gate. And then oftentimes these shepherds would hire somebody to guard that gate, that, that had all of their various sheep. When Jesus talks about my sheep hear my voice, it's actually this picture of walking into a pen and, and saying as a shepherd, calling out oftentimes by name, they would name their sheep oftentimes, and, and those sheep would actually come from the various flocks, come out of those various flocks and follow that shepherd out. There's three things I wanna talk about here. I wanna, I wanna talk about, first of all, the, I want, second of all, I wanna, we'll talk about the, the statements that he makes about the door and the shepherd. But the first thing we've gotta acknowledge here is right off the gate in verses one to two, he definitively says that there are thieves and robbers. It's interesting, in order to give an imagery of being a shepherd and being ultimately the good shepherd, God, Jesus didn't have to give us that picture, but he, he very specifically says there's thieves and there's robbers. At one point, he, he, he clarifies one company of those, and that's false messiahs. People that had come before and said that I, I'm the one that the, the scriptures have foretold. I am the one who's going to rescue Israel. What are their, their declarative messiahs who have publicly said those things or their perceived messiahs? He very specifically calls out that group. The second group seems to be false teachers. And the reason we think this is, is, is John 9 is this beautiful story of Jesus healing the blind man. And it's a blind man who specifically had been blind from birth. And it's the one where, where Jesus takes the mud, if you remember, and he puts it on his eyes and they, it, well, he actually takes the mud, he spits in it, and he puts it on his eyes. And that guy's eyes, he's, he's healed, his eyes are restored. But the rest of the chapter is actually this almost investigation that's happening by these religious leaders and by these neighbors. They thought at that time that you were only born blind if your parents or your family had sinned. And so they investigate that first and then they actually just go to their religious leaders and the guy stands before him, he goes, I actually, this is kind of interesting, right? So he, he put the mud on his eyes and then he had told him to go wash in the pool of Shalom. This guy never saw Jesus. So he goes and he washes and his eyes are clean, his eyes are restored. So they're grilling him on this situation. And he's like, I, I have no idea, but I was once blind and now I can see. Well, who was it? I, I, he said his name was Jesus. No idea what he looks like. So then the, the Pharisees are listening to this. They go, hold on a second. Did you say that he formed mud and he put it on your eyes on the Sabbath? So Jesus then enters into this beautiful analogy and he says, hey, there, there are thieves and robbers. There are false messiahs and ultimately false teachers. But, but religious leaders in that time, it, what, a, what a different time period where people would have their family that they would listen to. They would maybe have some close neighbors that they would get wisdom from. And then they would have maybe one or two religious leaders in their lives who are speaking wisdom. We now have countless voices to illustrate how different it is. I'll tell you a little story about, a, there was a man named Michael who lived at the turn of kind of the 1800s into the 1900s. And he had nine children. And he was uh, living in a town in Ohio and uh, had a very successful tailor shop, uh, enough to provide for his family. And he was Catholic. And at one point, uh, this man, Michael, his brother-in-law, Joseph Egan, who had been the funeral home director in this town, passed away. And so the priest came to him and he said, Michael, I actually need you to leave your job as a tailor 
and I need you to take over this funeral home. Our town doesn't have a funeral home director. And Michael took those words, the words of, of Bishop Hartley, as the Lord leading him. And he took over that funeral home, and I thank God that he did, because Michael was my great-grandfather. And he had nine children, one of which was obviously my grandfather, quick math there. And the five sons that he had all ran that funeral home, and it took them through the Great Depression, took them through multiple wars. And my uncle to this day runs the Egan Ryan Funeral Home in downtown Columbus, Ohio. Go Bucks, Jeff's not here. And I thank God that he did, but how different, can you imagine? Could you imagine getting breakfast or lunch with Jeff? And Jeff says, hey man, I, I know that you have a successful career in biochemical engineering. But I don't know if you've heard lately, but our, our city's really struggling to find male elementary school teachers. I need you to, I think the Lord is leading you to leave that job and to go be a teacher. One, not only do I think that we would go, hey, myself included, go, man, I, that's a weird idea. Uh, number two, I think we'd go, man, you don't have a right to tell me that. There's this fascinating podcast called The New Guru. And in this podcast, the, the, the whole exploration is this idea that we have hundreds of thousands of gurus in our pocket. In the opening episode, it talks about Steve Jobs and the fact that he was actually a Hindu and was a dedicated Hindu and would travel before he had started this company, would travel to India, would try to find a guru because in Hinduism, there's a certain level of achievement if you get your own guru. And there are quotes that they share in this episode where Steve Jobs explicitly says that my vision for the smartphone, one part of that vision, is that people would have a guru in their pocket. But he says a guru that they can form, that they can filter, that they can decide if it's right or wrong. Jesus says explicitly, there are thieves and robbers who will come down on the sides of the rocks and they won't enter by the door. And they come to steal and to kill and destroy. It's hard for us oftentimes to go, okay, false teachers, like, is that Eric? Jeff? Where, where does that go? But the teachers that are primarily forming us are in our pockets. A couple other things to think about in this area. There's leaders that we long to follow, oftentimes because of charisma or success. Even in this day and age, it's their courage that oftentimes draws us. Oftentimes we find ourselves really just wanting to listen to the sheep. How often is it easier when the, the, the shepherd begins to call and we hear his voice to just listen and ask, hey, was, was that the shepherd? But if that's the only voice, then there might be some risk. The worst decision that the Ryan family made in 2023, you're welcome for this, was that we got a puppy two months before our eighth child was born. The puppy showed up and he was 95 pounds as a puppy. He's now 150 pounds and he's not even two yet. For obvious reasons, we named this dog Bear. Bear is awesome. Bear's laid back for the most part. Uh, when he gets going, uh, running full speed on hardwood floors uh, with nails and there's toddlers around, it can be a little bit dangerous. Other than that, he's been an amazing dog. Bear's not a guard dog. Bear would maybe walk up to some thief or robber and look him in the chest. And for some people, that's intimidating. He'd maybe accidentally knock them over or do something like that. But Bear is so friendly. Bear is, is so open to the idea that the person knocking or pounding on the door might be my next best friend. That Bear would probably just sit there and watch our family's demise. 
That's a, it's a silly little illustration, but for some of us, we really need to hear in John chapter 10 that Jesus says, there are thieves and robbers. Because a lot of us are, are a little bit like bear and we take in articles and we take in videos and we take in reels and we take in clips without any actual filtering. And we have this amazing gift that God has given us to believe the best in people. And God has used that in tremendous ways, but at, at times we can be a little bit like bear. Hey, I need you to be discerning here. You have hundreds of teachers in your pocket. A couple of filters to think about. This is gonna be super quick because it's not the main point of this passage. And this is really just a thus saith Eric. But one of the things I've gleaned from older men that have invested in my life is their unique ability to understand where authors and teachers come from. I remember one time I was meeting with a mentor who, who had a little bit of a reputation um, for probably not being the deepest person, being super friendly and engaging, but uh, I remember, I'll never forget, as we would talk through commentaries, he, he could tell you where that person went to, went to seminary, who they discipled, who discipled them, what line they came from, what denomination they were in, what was formulating their thinking. And nowadays, we just, we just take everything in. A couple questions to ask is one is, what's their education? Where's it coming from? What's, what's their educational background? Where did they grow up? To who discipled them. And that, that doesn't mean that this is a Christian that you're necessarily having to listen to, but even in the secular world, who shaped that person? We've all been mentored, we've all been taught, we've all been formed what shaped them. There are many people that we listen to that God himself has shaped through trauma, through suffering. But there are at times people I think we listen to only because of that trauma. Some people we listen to because of their achievement and fame. And these are rarely, at times they are, but these are rarely good qualifiers. Verse seven through nine, we read this real quick. Jesus said again to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. This is the image, obviously, of a door to a sheep pen. There's another image I want to point to before we move through this part in Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, God is calling Noah to build the ark. And I had the opportunity for the first time this spring to go with our seventh graders in our school to the ark museum in Kentucky, many of you have probably been there and seen this thing, and they build this ark to the measurements that are found in scripture. And one of the things that was just a great reminder to me is that the ark had one door. It was a massive door, but it was one door. One door for Noah and his family to walk through and receive protection from the wrath of God towards the sin of the world. One door for the animals to walk through and to receive protection from the wrath of God towards sin. Listen to this in, in Genesis 6, 18, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall come into the ark. You, your sons, your wives, and your sons, your wives with you. Jesus says, I am the door, and I would not be surprised, maybe not every single religious leader there, but if one or two of them thought there was a door once, there was a door once that protected our people through Noah, that covered them underneath the covenant of God. As Jesus here is, is explicitly saying there is only one way into the flock. So why is this okay? Why is it okay? First of all, if, 
If, if you're a Christian and you struggle with that, you struggle with sharing that with friends. It would be different if I was to share with you, hey, Jesus is the only door and the reason he's the only door is because I said so. That would be different. That would be the, the height of arrogance. But it's not. This whole series we've, we've said, this is, this is for the sake that you would believe. As a family, we've looked at these passages of scripture and looked at his miracles. We've looked at what he declares about himself. And if we believe it's true, it's important to recognize. He says that he is the door. There's been an illustration that's been used here for years that our founding pastor came up with where he would say, look, if you were at a restaurant with a friend, and you got up from that table and you walked to go to the restroom and all of a sudden you overheard heard in the kitchen guys talking about your friend. And they didn't like him. In fact, it took such a dark corner that at one point this guy says, hey, this is his dessert. We could poison his dessert and this thing would be done. And you sit there and you're going, Oh my gosh, like I've, got to, I've got to go tell my friend. And so you go back to your table and you're having a conversation and he just begins to laugh at you. Come on, man, that's ridiculous. Nobody thinks that way about me. You go, no, no, I, dude, I need you to understand that they're going to bring you a dessert. The dessert is going to be poisonous. You cannot eat that dessert. And so finally your friend convinces you that you overheard something. You heard something wrong. Yeah, you're probably right. I, I was probably making things up. Then all of a sudden, the waiter that you heard talking brings out a dessert. You go, man, hey, dude, you cannot eat that dessert. Man, don't be ridiculous. Stop being a conspiracy theorist. And all of a sudden, he picks up that fork and he begins to, to cut into the cake. What would you do? It is not bigotry or arrogance to see Jesus for who he is, to believe with everything in your being that he is who he says he was, that he died and he rose again on our behalf, but to also believe every word that he says, to hear him say, I am the door, and to want to tell your friends. In fact, it would be the opposite. If we heard that and we sat idle by and we didn't tell our friends about who he is, that is a form of passivity and hatred. If you're in this room and you've not made a decision, you've not thought about who Jesus is, then I would beg that you would hear what he says in John 10. I am the door to the sheep. And that you would see his goodness and his mercy. You would see what he did for us on the cross and you would enter into that door. But for the Christian that we would be reminded that our good shepherd is the only door. And I've, I've seen how we respond when we think something is dangerous for our kids or for our grandkids. I've seen how we respond when we think something is dangerous for our country. That we would hear this this morning and we would be reminded that there are people all around us who don't yet know the door who have not yet stepped into that door by faith and that this weekend, this week, we would be praying, Lord, would you give me an opportunity to sit with them and to show you to them, the great shepherd, and to invite them in to the sheep pen, so to speak. Jesus also says here, I am the good shepherd. Let me read this beginning in verse 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for the sheep. 
and I have other sheep that are not in this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. Three quick observations I want to point out in this passage about the Good Shepherd. The first is this, that he is good. He says multiple times, I am good because I lay down my life for the sheep. All I would ask of you this morning is is to look upon that, to meditate upon that idea. He is not good because of his strategic leadership. He is not good because of his management of the sheep. The father has specifically said that he is good because he lays down his life for the sheep. If you would hear Jesus declare that he is the door and think him arrogant, then know that he is good because he lays down his life. Second thing to notice, that he knows us just as the Father knows him. Don't miss this. The good shepherd is good because he knows us and he allows us to know him just like the triune God where the Father knows the Son and the Son knows the Father. Man, that that is a statement that we could think on and explore until we go to be with them in heaven and we would not fully understand what he is saying. But he explicitly says, my sheep know me, I know my sheep, just like the Father knows me and I know him. Thanks be to God. The last thing to notice is that he talks about that there are sheep who are not in the fold yet. Most scholars would say that this is an allusion to the the expansion out into the Gentiles. Most of us in this room would not be a part of the fold of sheep if Jesus did not declare there are sheep who are not here yet. If Jesus did not send the apostles to go forth, we would not be a part of this. But the religious leaders, as they heard Jesus say, I am the good shepherd, would have been livid. And the primary reason they would have been livid is Psalm 23. Their favorite king, King David, wrote Psalm 23 and the opening verse says this, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You'll notice there that the Lord, it was, was capitalized, it was in all caps, Every time that means Yahweh, the official name of God, the name that he gave to himself. Moses was standing before the burning bush and God asked through the burning bush for Moses to go and to free his people from Egypt. And Moses says, who should I say sent me? God says, you tell them that I am has sent you. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I'm gonna read the rest of this chapter in Psalm. And I want you, I would encourage you to sit on this tomorrow morning or this afternoon and to think about what does it mean that the Lord is my good shepherd? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me by, beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. Surely goodness in in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord 
forever. Praise God that Jesus is our good shepherd. I want to spend the last 10 minutes here asking this question. So if Jesus says he's the good shepherd and he says his sheep hear his voice, then how do we? How do we practically hear the voice of our good shepherd? It's one thing to hear this awesome passage that many of us are familiar with. It's a whole nother thing to practically live this out. Maybe for some of us, we're wrestling with something right now. And we read in the passage this morning that Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, my sheep know me, and they hear my voice. And we're going, I need your help. Might even find ourselves a little bit frustrated. We'll give you three areas in scripture that we see that the ways that, that God speaks as the good shepherd, Jesus speaks to his people. The first is his word. The first is his word. 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us that his word is breathed out by God. It is his very breath. This is what this means. It means that the Bible is actually not our manual for life. The Bible is the written revelation of God. It is living and it is active. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It can pierce through both soul, bone, and marrow. There's an awesome story about a guy, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers who lived in the 1800s. And obviously back then they didn't have microphones. And so oftentimes he would walk into these, these big, oftentimes theaters to preach and he would walk in early and he would begin to warm up his vocals. And he would wanna test out the various acoustics. And one time he walked in and he began to just quote scripture. And the passage that he is quoting is when John the Baptist sees Jesus walking up to be baptized and he says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he just keeps repeating it. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world of the world and later on it was discovered in somebody's journal that they were on custodial staff in that arena, in that theater. And they were up in the balcony, probably where Charles couldn't see them and they were beginning to clean and they heard, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he says, I fell to my knees and I began to weep. And that was the moment that I found Jesus as my savior. God's word is powerful and is living and active and it is the primary way the good shepherd leads his sheep. It's not through commentary on the scriptures. It's not through books about the scriptures. It is through his word itself. And as we sit there in the morning and we begin to read that even when our reason cannot wrap itself around that passage, God himself through his written revelation is speaking to our hearts and he is changing us and he is leading us and he is guiding us to where we need to go. And we trust it. And as his sheep, we hear his voice and we follow. But our good shepherd was so good that he actually set up under shepherds. There's a passage in Matthew 16 where Jesus is talking to the disciples and he says to them, he says, hey, what are the people, who are the people saying that I am? And some say, well, you're, you're Elijah. And some say, well, no, some would say that you're John the Baptist. And Peter looks at him and he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he looks at Peter and he says, you are right. You're not right because you're smart. You're right because the father has actually revealed this to you. And, and, and you are now Petros. And on that rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And then he says something interesting. He says, I'm, I'm gonna give you the keys to the kingdom. And what you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, different denominations have actually interpreted this passage differently. The Catholic church would say that, that he said, you are Petros and on this rock, I'll build my church. And the keys were actually just handed to Peter. 
And Peter took those keys and he's passed it down person by person, generation by generation through the popes. And that's how the good shepherd leads his church. Many other denominations, congregationalists, so to speak, see that he handed it to the apostles that were there and the apostles handed the keys to every single believer. What you bind on heaven, earth shall be bound in heaven. What you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Here at Perimeter, we're part of the Presbyterian Church in America. We believe that he did speak it to the disciples, that the foundation that he was gonna build his church on was the confession of Peter, that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, our Lord and Savior. But the apostles were all there and we see in Acts that the apostles are the leaders of the church that then go out and what do they do? Paul, we see in Titus and 1 Timothy, he sets up overseers, he sets up elders to lead the church. So we would say we believe in a plurality of leadership that that voice of the shepherd, it doesn't doesn't just go to one individual and it doesn't necessarily in that way in the leading of the church go to all the individuals, but he sets up under shepherds, elders to lead the church, not as individuals where somebody would come up to you and say, hey, I'm an elder, you need to do this instead of that, but where the group of elders, he would give wisdom and leadership and direction. So we do believe that one of the ways that we listen to the voice of our good shepherd is through the leadership of the church. Not in any individual, but in that group of elders and that he leads us that way. The third is that he leads us through the conscience of the believer that that is captured and anchored by the Holy Spirit and his word. Not just the conscience of the believer that that doesn't put any effort into studying God's word, but the conscience of the believer who is saturated in God's word and and clinging through the leadership of the Holy Spirit in that conscience. Paul says at one point, he says, hey, look, some of you have been eating food to sacrifice to idols. Some of you think that's wrong. For those of you who think it's wrong, don't place that on them if their conscience is clear, the Lord leads through the conscience of a believer. But that conscience can grow weak. That conscience can struggle. And so what does it look like that the Lord would use these three things in our life to lead us? Many of you know this story, but back in 2014, I was driving into work here at Perona Church from Lawrenceville and I was listening to a sermon. And the sermon was on the Imago Dei. It was on the sanctity of human life. And it was doing, the pastor was doing an amazing job illustrating where our nation had gotten to in the area of life. And for whatever reason, the Lord used it to convict me in an unusual way. But I didn't know where he was leading. The, The sermon ended by him saying, hey, instead of picketing, what if you said to those people, hey, don't, don't kill your child. I will, I will take them and raise them as my own. And so his application was foster care and adoption. So I go, okay, great. Uh, Lord, we are open as a family to foster care and adoption. Picturing, I, I promise you, picturing 15, 20 years out, we'll have our family, we'll walk into that together. The next day was the snow apocalypse. And some of us were smart enough to leave work early and go get lunch. So I was sitting across from a pastor, a friend, an elder of my church. I'm sitting across and he says, hey man, have you ever considered foster care and adoption? I said, yeah, yesterday. (laughs) He's like, man, that's really cool because three kids need a home. I was like, oh, okay. So what did we do from there? Well, we, we were gracious enough to have an amazing community and we set up meetings with couples who knew us, many of which the husband is an elder in our church. So, hey, what do you, what do you think? What does this mean? We put people on there that I was like really hopeful. We're gonna be like, that's crazy. Don't do that. All of them, all of them said, hey, this seems to be where God is taking you. And they said sentences that were the same. And the Lord would just lead and he would say the exact thing we needed to hear to clear the road, 
to open up the door. I remember one of them saying, look, it's foster care, man. Just start taking a step. It'll close if God wants it to. It's not even hard. And we just started stepping. And the whole way, we're listening to our conscience. Lord, at any given point, you can close this door by convicting us otherwise. But what he did was the opposite. And I remember one time sitting with my wife and saying, baby, I, I think if we say no, <laughs> we had just moved into a four bedroom foreclosure. We had three open bedrooms. If we just say no, I think it's wrong. I think it's wrong. It's not explicit in scripture that we have to do this, but the Lord works through the conscience of a believer. You take those things. It would have been probably a little bit foolish, a little bit bold to just hear the sermon and go. It would have been a little bit foolish maybe to not listen to the wisdom of elders and others in our church. It would have been foolish to not wait for the Lord to convict that conscience and to say to go. And he did all those three things and we knew, okay, this is where the shepherd is leading us. So I pray for everyone in this room that we would understand, we'd be able to filter those voices and listen to our great shepherd. Let's pray now. Jesus, thank you. Lord, we worship you for being our good shepherd. You are so good. Lord, would you help us to hear your voice? Holy Spirit, would you prick our hearts when we are foolishly listening to thieves and robbers and others who would come in to steal and kill and destroy? And Lord, would you lead us through your word, through your church, and through our conscience? We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to the Perimeter Church Sermon Podcast. Perimeter Church is located at the corner of Highway 141 and Old Alabama Road in Johns Creek, Georgia. Please visit our website at www.perimeter.org for more information, to give us your feedback, and to find other sermons from our teaching team. Thanks for making this podcast a part of your day.